All right, so Vinny recommended a film for us. Let's talk about it. Yes, I did. I recommended it. <laughs> I recommended a, a, a little magic movie called uh, The Illusionist. Uh, I mean, The Prestige. Um, <laughs> I saw yeah. that joke coming. Damn yep. you. But yeah, so um, I, I do think it's very funny when that happens. It happen, it, it happens a lot. and it's. My dad funny. mentioned it last night when I rewatched it. He was like, you know, a movie came out around the same time, and I was like, called The Illusionist. And then he's like, yeah, called The Illusionist. Yeah. I haven't it's seen it, but it, I've seen one clip, and it's very funny. There's like a bit where Edward Norton in a really bad British accent is like, perhaps I'll make you disappear. And I just, so I like, <laughs> I'll watch this movie eventually when I'm drunk. Average, so, average editor. Let's go. Yeah. But uh, as I was saying, uh, the film I recommended was The Prestige from 2006, directed by uh, Christopher Nolan. Uh, It is the movie he made when he got a big fat check for Batman Begins. And um, it's about, (laughs) um, yeah, so spoilers for The Prestige. There's a lot that can be spoiled in this movie. We're going to spoil the shit out of this movie. If you haven't seen the film... Go watch it and then come back. Do not listen to this conversation. It. Literally, <laughs> the entire movie is going to be ruined for you, and this is yeah. not a movie. Mm-hmm. Where yeah, you this is that. a movie you you really do not need want to know anything about it. But yeah, it is a film about uh, two musicians. But if we want to get more specific, it is technically about three mu- magicians. I said musicians before. Uh, <laughs> yeah, musicians. Um, it's about three musicians. Yeah, it was about three three magicians who are in a locked in a battle of wits and obsession to try and one up the other with their magic tricks, which is very interesting because I did some research and this was apparently a thing that a lot of magicians did in the uh, uh, 19th century, like in the oh yeah, in, in the, at that me. big turn of the at the big turn getting ready into the 1900s. There were so many magicians who were like trying to one up each other with their techniques and their tricks and all of that stuff. And this movie basically took inspiration from that as well as the book that it's based on. But apparently it's very different from the novel that it is based on. Uh, Mm -hmm. It is a lot more streamlined than the book from what I have looked up. It is a lot more accessible, but at the same time, it's very, it's very, um, complex which you can expect from nolan but what i like about this film the most and what makes it my current favorite nolan film and i think probably my favorite movie currently is that it is very um it's it's a nice balance between nolan's like early stuff where it's like very like very simple characters very simplistic stuff and the high concept stuff that he does later with stuff like Inception or Interstellar. Yeah. It's, a, it, yeah. it, 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 it's a nice balance between the two because I think what makes it work is that it's a period piece and in the way that the only really big, like, fantastical element of it is the cloning aspect, which is, I think, really helps to, you know, elevate it and yeah. it makes the movie almost like science yeah. fiction. Like, the, the, the movie starts off and it's basically just like a period piece, like drama thriller, but then they mm-hmm. add in that extra like stuff with all the cloning and stuff with Nikola Tesla, and it really like kicks the movie into high gear, and you're like, okay, this is interesting. And another thing I absolutely love about the movie is there's there there's like a purveying thing with a lot of films that I love, like um, uh, the Holy Mountain or like um, Barton Fink or Eraserhead, where it's like stuff that's very abstract. But there's also a really nice place in my heart for movies that work both on a literal sense and a metaphorical sense, because this is one of those movies sort of like Alien, where it's sort of like, this movie works when you look at it on a surface level, but below the surface, there's a lot of symbolism and like allegories for other aspects of like, like mostly what the movie is about is the process of filmmaking, because like they have that whole conversation about like, magic tricks consist of three acts just like how movies consist of three acts and it's sort of about like how the whole movie is basically one big magic trick and the whole film is just laid out that all of the answers are there for you they're all like right there in front of you to the point where characters literally like state the twist like 10 minutes into the film and at the end of the movie you're still like you're still like oh shit and that's what makes it so interesting to go back and rewatch and sort of like understand through the context of everything. But yeah, I, I love this film. Mm-hmm. Uh, nice. 
I'll I uh, I'll just go next because yeah, we'll just go up the list and Aaron will go last I guess or something mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. but um yeah I watched it twice I I didn't expect to watch it twice but um it was really good I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it um there's a lot to love in both Nolan's affinity for both the literal mm -hmm. and the non literal storytelling it's almost as if he's he's actively yeah just like pulling off a magic trick in front of you he's like misdirecting you and and you know tricking you but also not like not in like a dickish way it doesn't feel like the film is intentionally like baiting you and like kind of just being like oh it might be this oh you're wrong haha -ha, i got you it's like it, it's not like trying to be show offy with that shit because there are a lot of movies that do that um, that do that shit where they uh, where they like essentially present you with something and then they take it away and then they essentially give it back and it's just like okay you literally just told me that it's not that but it is and it's like it's very insistent on how smart it is and it just comes across as like pretentious and stupid but this movie actually strikes a good balance it it doesn't feel like it's being pretentious it feels like it's still telling a story that that like is very that that's, that just happens to be very detailed and twisted, you know. Hmm. And uh, one thing I didn't expect is that this is probably one of the most violent PG thirteen movies I've seen in a while. Like, there's like <laughs> yeah. actual there's like actual fucking dismemberment. Like, <laughs> Jesus. Um, I really love the I really love the those effects. By the way, like the the scene where um, the scene where like uh he gets his fingers shot where Christian Bale gets his fingers shot off. That's that was like a really when I first saw yeah. that that was really like whoa. Like that really got me. Um, yeah, I didn't expect these guys to like really go after each other the way they did. I thought it was just gonna be like, ah, oh, one of them's gonna get punched in the face once in a while. And it's like, holy shit, no, they're like actually causing like active bodily harm that leaves them almost like disabled in ways. Like straight up, yeah. Christian Bale loses fingers. Hugh Jackman walks around with a cane, and like, Jesus Christ, like, <laughs> yeah, it was really cool watching all that stuff go down and you know it wouldn't be nearly as fun without these two great actors at the helm i love christian bale's performance it, definitely my favorite performance of the film i would say christian bale hugh jackman was great too um i really enjoyed michael kane david bowie very briefly fucking awesome uh i, I wasn't a huge fan of joe hansen's performance she kind of came yeah, across I as like agree. a theater yeah. kid doing a british accent that was really really that was weird my one issue with the film her accent yeah. is like it, not good it's so <laughs> weird it sounded so american trying to be british it's like my british accent like i, I don't know i couldn't there like i could not believe her when she was like doing the whole like when she was snapping on hugh jackman i was just like yeah i I don't believe it, you know, and it's weird again that I'm watching another movie with Johansson in a younger role where she's actually great. I'm rewatching the man who wasn't there in that movie. She's not in it very long, but she's great in that movie. But in this movie, she's, I don't know, she's in it much more, but she's, uh, it's just weird. Um, I also love the evolution of uh, the parallels between the evolution of technology and the evolution of magic. That was really cool. Like when they brought in all the Tesla stuff and like, the industrialization of the world and almost as if music was be uh, sorry music no the magic <laughs> magic was being industrialized so you know that was really cool um i don't really have a ton to say about it right i, I want to like let everybody else have their piece before i go deeper into the film but um yeah it it was it's definitely one of the better nolan movies i think i think that if i had to rank it it would probably be number 3 maybe number Number four, because also, I, I, funny enough, I rewatched Dunkirk uh, the other last night with my dad. Uh, sorry, two nights ago with my dad. Uh, that's still my favorite Nolan. But um, yeah, I, the Prestige really good. I enjoyed it. I've got a lot more to say about it, but I just want to let uh, Nikki go next. It was my first time watching the movie. Uh, I actually watched it last night with Xander, and I really enjoyed it. It kept me like on like the edge of my seat, like. I kept on like getting really upset at the characters for all like the stupid stuff they did, which was very childlike. Like how Xander said, like the whole like you would think they would just be like you know like little name callings and stuff, but they actually went at each other's throats and like kind of like fucked each other's up, like fucked each other up, which I thought was like crazy. And like the whole twist at the end, where it's revealed that like he has a twin brother, like that caught me off guard. I was like, oh wow, okay. Um. I, I thought it was a really good twist. 
to the movie you think that um there's it's just um like the main character and stuff and like he's the one that's doing it all by himself but then it's revealed that like he has a twin brother so you don't know who was involved in it and stuff but no i like i was saying like i thought that twist at the end where it's revealed that he has a twin brother uh was a pretty good twist um i wasn't expecting it at all um along with like the whole clones like the like just the huge like storage oh, yeah. area filled with clones that was that was really cool i liked that and then um i had also mentioned xander yesterday he told me to bring it up but like with julia's death i thought that like christian Bale's character was like responsible for it and i kept on telling xander and he's like just watch the movie just wait till the end and then when the twin brother came you really don't know who was in which position mm-hmm. and stuff so when he was when um hugh jackman's character at the funeral was like which not did you tie? And he's like, I don't know. You assume that he's just being jackass and just doesn't want to admit that, like, he was at fault. But then at the end, you think, okay, well, maybe he wasn't the twin that was actually out there when Julia died and stuff. So I, I liked that twist. I thought it was really good. Nice. Is that all? Is that all? Or, yeah. Is yeah, that that's all for like, now, yeah. Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> um, I'm glad I rewatched this. You know, it's been a while since I watched it for the first time. I think it was like, years and years ago but uh, i remember you know all of the twists quite uh vividly and it's a very satisfying story it's a story about just like not just obsession but also about uh addictions in a way and how you can use your power and i really enjoyed all of the acting i thought this was um you know some of the best work these actors have ever done especially hugh jackman i, I really enjoyed him in this one yeah yeah. And um you know I it made me really miss that this side of Nolan where he's mostly <laughs> just like you know not overly complicated with his plots and like not overly obsessed with like the spectacle of a movie cuz yeah. like I feel like especially with Tenet and Interstellar like those movies really hone in on like the spectacle of the uh, of the plot and stuff like that and mm-hmm. they forget this... about the characters and yeah, like that's, ground, that's right. Grounding your story and people you can like root for and relate to. Yeah, for sure. Like I, I can say so many things about the characters in this movie compared to like fucking characters in <laughs> Tenet. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's the side of Nolan I really miss, especially like the look of it too. It's like very distinct. It's like super old fashioned mm-hmm. and it's very elegant to look at. And it's not like the, uh, you know, technically complicated and, you know, practical look of his modern day movies and which which i do like for the most part but this one really feels like a film you know it's something you would watch in like a grand theater rather yeah, than a yeah. uh, multiplex i think it has some of his uh strongest writing in his career i really like the twists and everything that it has going for it mm-hmm. and um yeah there were a few things that held me held me back from really loving it just like uh as Andrew said, the Scarlett Johansson performance yeah. was kind of distracting. I couldn't really believe her. And uh, there were just a few editing moments, too, that caught me off guard. But that's kind of yeah. more in style. Uh, yeah, the whole, to... like... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, I was just going to say, he uh, he really likes to, like, cut early or, like, cut really uh, quickly to something. It's it's kind of weird to describe, but... He also know, loves no to way. do this... Yeah, this he loves to do this thing... To... Um, the scene where Sarah commits suicide is that the yeah that's one of them too that's one yeah but them. also I'm thinking about like scenes where they reveal like uh, where they reveal crucial things and it's like almost like calling back to past events in the film and you briefly cut oh, back to that yeah. event occurring mm-hmm. like for like a split second and it's like okay I get it like I, I get that that's like his thing he did it in the Dark Knight and he did it in like all mm-hmm. the Batman movies mm-hmm. and it's like but here's the thing. Even in the Batman movies that I, well, at least the Dark Knight is the only one that I actually really enjoy. Um, I did, I don't like it there, and I don't like yeah, it I here. Agree. I just, it's like, I don't know. I don't feel like the movie is long enough to justify that. If the movie were much longer, like three hours, I would actually, I don't know. There's a part of me that thinks runtime should allow little things like mm-hmm. that, you know? But yeah, but like. You know, here this movie is yeah, it's over two hours, but it's only like two hours and ten minutes. I, I was able to like remember long, remember far back enough to to get what they were referring to without having to cut. 
back to it, I was just like, okay, that's just kind of Nolan's thing, and I'm not a fan of that, but whatever. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can see that for sure, too, because uh, I don't think it's as bad as, like, The Dark Knight Rises, where the editing of that movie is kind of ob- obnoxious. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of messy. <laughs> To say the least, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoy this. It's uh, it has a good pace to it for the for the most part, right. and uh, yeah, it, it keeps you hooked. Like Nikki said, it keeps you engaged. It doesn't really uh let you go once it starts. I really like mm-hmm. the narration in the beginning, especially. I really think that was cool. That was really cool. Strongly. The the energetic mm-hmm. the energetic pace of the beginning is it really hooks you. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It seemed yeah. like I don't know. He, he just Nolan had a tighter grasp on this one than he did with like you know his later works tenet, mm-hmm. tenet. <laughs> I, actually tenet. Have a, I have a weird comparison and i only um i only make this comparison because recently i was watching i was re-watching some cosmonaut marcus videos and um i was re-watching his specifically his uh one of uh, his harry potter review just because like i i work sometimes and like you know i i like listening to stuff like that where i don't have to watch the Video. Anyway, so he said that J.K. Rowling is um, good at creating interesting ideas, but less, but less skilled at executing them. And honestly, I feel the same way for Nolan. Like he's really good at creating interesting and hook and and ideas that like hook you in, but he's like less talented at executing them. It seems, especially with his most recent films. Yeah. Yeah, especially with his most recent films like Tenet and uh, Interstellar, movies that really do have a great hook, but then like once you get into the film, you kind of realize that the execution is really muddled. And I don't know, maybe Inception for me is the exception. I haven't seen it in a long time. Like it's been, it's been like five, maybe six years since I've seen it. So I do have to give it a rewatch. But um. Yeah, no, especially with Tenet, it feels like that movie had a really great concept and an idea, but Nolan, I guess, kind of lost his lost a way to execute it in the shuffle, so he kind of just winged it almost, it feels like, and it just kind of feels much more confused than the concept deserved, because, like, I really enjoyed the hook for Tenet. I'd say the first, like, 10 to 15 minutes of that movie is actually pretty great, but um, then the rest of it's, like, really, really fucking, fucking messy and hard to follow but yeah you know the prestige is an example yeah. where he actually had a not only a cool idea but it seems that he actually had a really good you know feel for how to execute it and it was really well done in that regard i, I and and same thing with dunkirk except that movie also has like a couple of mishaps in the execution but this movie yeah. this movie too d- does too and again dunkirk is still my favorite nolan but like you know here he it feels like a solid execution of a really cool idea. So, you know, I, again, it was a weird comparison, but I always, I, I just found it funny when Cosmonaut mentioned that. And I was like, wait, but Nolan does the same thing. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. It was really funny. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Open floor. Yeah, everyone can talk now. Yeah. I would say in terms of the, um, the editing it doesn't really bug me i think it's more just in terms of how it's paced because i really love how this movie is framed in terms of its narrative because i think something that because my biggest issue with dunkirk is how the film is paced and i think it's because dunkirk the whole the whole like thing about Mm. dunkirk is it's like it's edited like a christopher nolan movie they jump in between chronological shit and to the point where I'm not exactly sure what the purpose is other than sort of keeping people on the edge of their seat or sort of keeping it unique compared to like other war films. That's I think fair. What, That's yeah, fair. I think what, what makes this work is similar to how it works in Memento is when Memento, the reason that they keep intercutting between chronological stuff is to sort of put you in the mind of the protagonist. And they sort of do that here where it's like, it keeps cutting back to them reading each other's diaries and that diary framing device, I think, really helps bring the movie back where it's like, because the main, like, chronological, like, timeline you can see is it goes from, like, when um, when Borden goes behind the stage and finds the body under the, in the tank, all the yeah. way to, all the way to when um, he goes back to his, um, his daughter, right? And that's mm-hmm. like the framing device, but it keeps jumping back through the point where he's like reading, um, he's reading um, Angier's diary, like that whole like thing, I think really helps 
like sort of keep the movie fresh and sort of keep getting you back into information you may not have been held privy to. I think it it, it helps a lot for me. Yeah. I I agree. I just think that like, you know, I don't I in Dunkirk it's different because I don't I don't mind the structure of that film there because that movie doesn't really have a story. It's more about an, an encompassing an event, you know, a, true. like a true event. So yeah, yeah, there are parts where it does feel a little weird and it's like, okay, you did, really didn't have to do this and they could have done it all in chronological order and it would have been really interesting, but I think that like there are still purposeful reveals in that movie that are brought out by the structure so it doesn't feel all that pointless to me if it were done in prestige i would like i would i would totally agree with you it'd be fucking weird but this movie yeah. does have more of a structure to it that feels catered to a narrative whereas you know in dunkirk there obviously isn't much of a narrative you know because like yeah. you know that that isn't supposed to have a narrative it's simply supposed to be about the the soldiers on the beach and and the the civilians on the boat and then the, the guy in the air you know it's just mm -hmm. about those people so they structure the film in that way to to like uh to give you the best of all worlds while not feeling like it's focusing more on one than the other you know mm -hmm. i guess is how i see it but um yes i i do understand it here this movie has a very tight structure i yeah. I really do love. I do. I do kind of agree when, when it comes to the editing. There are certain like little bits. I think the biggest moment where it's very obvious is the part where um, where Angier is reading the diary in the hotel, and he's like reading the part where he, it's like the the bit where um where the other um where the other twin. I I because like when it, when it helps, it helps to like go through the movie and refer to two twins as different people. So I call one one of the twins Alfred and the other one Freddie because Freddie is what um Olivia Scarlett Johansson's character calls him. So I think that part is like when Freddie is explicitly writing in the diary and it keeps just cutting back to different stuff. He was like I've been convinced since he led me to root and then it cuts back to him finding like the other Hugh Jackman, like that weird actor. Yeah, oh my god, that Yeah. So I, I love, love that, that I love that whole it's sequence. So yeah, that's that's one of the se best sequences of the movie. I especially love how they um they pay attention to the direct to the sorry director to the uh, to the doppelganger's teeth like they actually mm -hmm. pay attention a lot to how he works like you can actually tell like he yeah it's played by the same actor but he looks different like the teeth yeah. are more crooked yeah. and weird looking like his eye color is different like he he has a bit of a weirdly sh a differently shaped jawline somehow it's like i really like how they pulled that off that whole sequence what and like obviously like Hugh Jackman's performance. Like, yeah, he also does a good job at like pretending he's himself playing himself. You know, right? Yeah, I agree with Aaron yeah. about how this is like one of my favorite performances from Hugh Jackman. I think just mm -hmm. it, like the fact he basically has to play three different people because he plays Angier and he plays um, Root, but that he also has to play Lord Caldlow, which is like who he really is. Which is why, like sure. with Scarlett Johansson, I criticize her like inconsistency in her accent but when it comes to like Hugh Jackman his accent is a little inconsistent at points but I started to realize on multiple watches that's the point he's not American he's actually British his name is Lord Caldo like that's like who he that's like who he really is and that's how yeah. he's able to like amass all that money at the end of the story and like yeah. all that stuff I do say yeah, I, no, I really like things, that detail all of those three performances I will say Lord Cal the, how he plays Lord Caldo is probably the weakest but like, for sure but he's also not in the film long yeah, enough to leave that to exactly. like evolve you know he's literally just oh this is just my real thing and yeah. like he's not it really given time to though. expand upon that you know yeah they do have like a little bit of foreshadowing at the beginning where he's like i promised my family i wouldn't bother them with my theatrical endeavors because they're rich and they don't want to see like one of their kids doing magic or some shit yeah apparently it's a lowly endeavor yeah <laughs> lowly in theatrical endeavors you're not allowed to practice magic, you heathen. I just think it's, uh, I like the ironic detail in knowing that uh, Hugh Jackman despises the drunk version of himself. That was, yeah. Yeah. He's on his own path to self-destruction, so it's like, there's, mm -hmm. that's the irony there. I really enjoyed yeah. that. But, there's sure. so much great like little bits like plastered throughout the movie. I think one of my favorite mm -hmm. little details in the story is the entire like contrast between the bird trick 
and how the like the new transported man is performed because the new transported man is basically like a huge over complex version of the bird trick but with people instead because they sh- they establish like at the beginning how like they take a bird they show it to the audience they put it in a cage and then they smash the cage and in the process they kill it but they use yeah. another bird to sort of like pretend trick like you. the bird is alive and to trick you and that's exactly how the the new transported man at the end of the movie is done with Hugh Jackman because he kills himself every single day and then a new Hugh Jackman comes out of the box and like presents himself as the prestige and like that's yeah. another really great little thing I love I love um what do you guys think of um the Chung Ling Su the, the the Chinese magician who's based on a real guy apparently yeah based on a real guy I heard about yeah. that I saw I, I watched the the Mr. Sunday movies discussion on this film a couple months ago and it, it's interesting apparently the guy the real guy that Chung Ling Su is based on he was he was a white man pretending to be Chinese and he never spoke and a word old. of English. Yeah, he never spoke a word of English for like ten years until the day he died, and his last words were, "Oh, I've been shot." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he tried bullet shit. cats. He tried <laughs> bullet cats, yeah, he and tried. he got <laughs> fucked up. Like, yeah, yeah. No, that was that. That it was really interesting to read about that, and it honestly made me think. Like, you know, obviously, yeah, this the great Danton and like these guys, like they're not real, but. I, it would have been really interesting to find out that maybe there were two rival magicians that would go this far to yeah. like hinder each other and and just screw up screw up each other's careers and and livelihoods. And also, I love the um, I I, I kind of love the uh, the implication with the ending with the twins. There's actually a lot of great foreshadowing to that moment. There's like the scene where the kids like, "Where's his brother?" Mm-hmm. And like that's like a very interesting right. foreshadowing to like the twin to Christian Bale having a twin. You can see it on his face. Like he's just like, oh shit. Like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And also like there's um I really love that moment where um where like one of them gets hanged and you kinda don't know like which one like we you don't you're not really sure if the one that um takes care of the girl from now on is the father or not. You kind of realize that, like, they're, that, that they're that yeah, they take turns, but it could have been lost in the shuffle, you know. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's like really interesting. I like, that, to, I like to think that the, it's his real father. It's, it's his real father. father. Yeah, me I mean, too. I do too. Yeah, I also like, like to imagine that when they're arguing, when the two, when one of the brothers and and Rebecca Hall are arguing, and like Fallon takes the girl away, like in in like a caring way. I I, I like to think that Fallon doing that, like that's her real father, like being like it's okay. Alfred. Yeah, 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 that, uh, yeah. Like when I, because when I watched it um, the second time, all these years after, I I noticed how specifically whenever it was, like the the way that they contrast the two brothers is one of them is definitely more obsessed than the other. Like there's this oh yeah whole yeah bit towards the yeah, end where like one of them is one of them, and I like to think that that one is Freddie, the one who was in love with Scarlett Johansson, rather than uh-huh, uh-huh. the one rather than was, Alfred, the other one. rather than Alfred who had the kid. And I think the the closest thing I have to that is basically like because one of the because they do establish one of them loves magic more than they love Rebecca Hall, and that's another thing that really that's really interesting to look back on the whole like do you, I love you and he was like you don't love me today or you do love yeah me. yeah that whole yeah. like dynamic of like oh yeah. do, do you lo- are you loving do you love me today or or do you, you love caught me on a, more, you caught like, me on a good day like. That was, yeah. Those are really, those are also really good foreshadowing moments, you know. Yeah, that whole that whole bit where he they're like at the restaurant and he's just like so viscerally like relieved that his that his brother didn't die after being buried alive. Like that yeah. whole bit, like that that little bit of the performance is so good. Like, yeah. And also, like, I I fucking I'm trying to remember the other thing I was gonna say about that whole like thing. Oh. The one thing that I blew my fucking mind when I rewatched this film was how everybody talks about the big transported man sequence with the two uh, Bordens. But mm-hmm. what's interesting is we technically see it before he even talks about the trick. We see the transported man after he goes on the date with Rebecca Hall. And he's like, do you mind if I come in for a cup of tea? And she's like, I don't think the landlord would like that. Yeah. And then she goes in and Borden's already inside her apartment making tea. And that's uh-huh. how that's the first time we see the transported man because that's one of the Bordens leaves, but one of the board the other Borden already snuck into the house and pretended like he'd teleported into the house. Such a great little moment. Details. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I know we've been harping about like you know all the great stuff. I I do want to take a moment to say that um I do think that the period piece element was kind of sloppy. 
Um, I don't know what it is about me. I don't know why, but I feel like when period pieces, unless they're focusing on like the rich, like, you know, Barry Lyndon in the second half, I can't get into it if it's too clean. And sometimes it feels too clean. Like the act, like aside from the double, Hugh Jackman's double, like all the teeth, like looked fine. Like nobody looked disheveled at all. And I know they're supposed to, like even Borden, who kind of doesn't yeah, live in. Should, Borden should be a little bit more schleppy because he's. He very, should like, be because he's like, he's not, he's, like he's definitely more. Yeah. He's not as rich as Lord, like Lord Caldwell, like Hugh Jackman. It's a little more understandable. He's a showman. He does. This is what he does. He's got a lot of money. But with Bale, it's like, you know, yeah. Yeah, he's successful, but I don't see him as like somebody who can like you know clean up clean clean up like after himself all the time. You know, there's like a point mm. where it's like, okay, I feel like you should look a little bit like more not raggedy, but just like you know, like <laughs> I, I, it's hard to describe. I just I don't know why this issue is so prevalent with me in period pieces. That's why I struggle a lot with period pieces when they're too clean. I'm just like, damn it, I can't get into this because I mean, a lot of period pieces were made before. A lot of period pieces take place in times where where the fucking running running sewer or like sewer did not exist. So you know, plumbing did not exist. So clearly they had to use the bathroom in chamber pots and then throw them out the fucking window. So yeah, you know, it's like yeah, yeah. It's like there are points where I'm just like, okay, this is just a little weird. But um, I think, I think like aside from that, like the language felt pretty uh, solid. I didn't really recall anybody like feeling like they're speaking in like a modern dialect for 2000, whenever this movie came out to that 2000, 2003. Oh, 2006. Wow. I was way off, but um, yeah. It, and also I, maybe another performance that kind of bugged me. I, I don't know if I was a huge fan of Andy circus. Uh, oh, with the New York accent. The yeah. Accent was, that accent was, was also really weird. <laughs> so every day I get to see the great, so every day you're the great day in time. Like, uh, it's like, okay, dude, like, Relax. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little weird. Weird. This is it's Christopher Nolan's approximation of what Americans are like. like <laughs> yeah, because he's a fucking like... British dude. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, it, it was a little. It was hey, really you weird. Everything you know? the audience had in their pockets. Like, <laughs> yeah. what am I holding in my pocket? I got the, I got the gabagool. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Circus in The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> That would be probably the best episode of the entire series. One hundred percent. Hell yeah, <laughs> David but Bowie though. Gandalf he was. Oh yeah, David. Great. I love David Bowie. Movie. Fantastic. Fuck, yeah. he was great. He's he did a good an job. amazing fucking actor, and he should have yeah. been in more movies. Like, yeah. too bad he too bad he had to clock out early. But yeah, no, yeah. it's like I love. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that. But I say like, like that because he's literally one of my most favorite <laughs> artists and musical like musical icons of all time. And I just said, huh, he clocked out early, lol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a total asshole oh, for that. <laughs> but yeah, no, he's he actually like a great, actor. genuine actor. He was in, he he was in Labyrinth, which yeah, like wasn't a good movie, but he was great in. Like mm -hmm. I, I love his brief performance in Temptation of Christ, Last Temptation of Christ, and then yeah, he's in this movie, and his accent doesn't sound fucking weird at all. Me and my dad were like, oh yeah, okay, wasn't Tesla like Austrian or German? And we looked it up, and it's like. Oh no no wait he's Serbian Croatian like we were so off it was really Damn. funny yeah but I yeah also, like I think what helps me in terms of making it period accurate is the throwing in of real historical figures like Tesla I think yeah the, but not making them like Tesla so good. prevalent where it feels like oh these people yeah yeah oh. it doesn't feel like walk hard where they're like making fun of like oh guys look it's elvis oh look it's buddy well, that's, Holly. Di well, that's different that movie's a comedy i can forgive <laughs> oh, yeah. that movie for having shit like that because that's a comedy yeah. that's a really yeah, good movie in my eyes no because like if if it were like more over present i'd be like this is what they were making fun of in hot in 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 walk hard so yeah if they did that it would have been like it would have it would have felt more like oh this is just what dewey cox did for comedy <laughs> not christopher nolan's doing for seriousness you know yeah exactly Christopher Nolan, director of Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. <laughs> All they would need to do is just keep jumping back and forth in between the past and present, and then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I, oh, something I did notice that's really interesting. Is I want to get more into like how the movie symbolizes filmmaking because I think what Christopher Nolan does this a lot with his movies, and he sort of uses it as a crux now. It was fun when he did it with the Prestige, but then he did it with fucking inception and then he 
did it again with Tenet, where the main character was literally named the protagonist. And I'm like, I get it. No, I <laughs> really, really like making movies. I get it. But like with the whole like with this, I think it really works well because like the metaphors aren't like super mixed up like they are in Inception. But mm-hmm. like I think what something that I noticed that's really interesting is how they both represent two different types of filmmakers. Like the two Bordens, they represent like the filmmaker that wants to take risks and do new things and do things that are really interesting. And you contrast that with um, Angier slash Caldlow, and he's more interested about pleasing an audience because that there's that whole bit at the end where he talks about how he the the thing he cared about the most when he was performing was seeing the look on the audience's faces when they got surprised because like the world is like so dark and like dingy and like the only real like solace from like the hardness of life is to like devote yourself to your art so that you yeah. can like get the audience on the same level as you are. And I think that there's that great scene where um he, he does his transported man trick and mm-hmm. Hugh Jackman is under the, under the stage and he like hears the audience and he's like so pissed off, but he decides to bow anyways. Like that bit I absolutely love. Yeah. That, that's, that was a really cool moment when I, I oh i just realized i took these notes when i first saw it so i recorded i recorded and i'll read i'll read exactly what i said because i think what i said was stupid mm. i don't know oh. how i feel about the storytelling itself it feels rather erratic which is an issue i have with most nolan films mm. not an issue that i have now i'm I'm more on board with the rather jumpy storytelling you know it, it, there is more of a structure to it than than other nolan movies you know oh yeah one thing i i wanted to bring up the music i really really like david julian's score i think everybody associates like him with hans zimmer now but i think what what i like about this is that it's not over present and it doesn't fucking drive every scene which is uh something that happens a lot in a lot of christopher nolan movies i think that this one it's a lot more subdued the soundtrack is a lot more like atmospheric and there, it's very much like window dressing, you know. I really like the score for this film. Uh, yeah, I remember. I don't remember like specific pieces in my head right now, but I I do remember thinking it was really solid. Yeah. You know, I just like I just like the fact that it's not just blom like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like no Inception way. shit. <laughs> it actually had uniqueness to it. Yeah, and like the yeah. Inception score is cool on its own, but it it drives too many of the sequences for me. Like. I would agree. It does feel very overpresent, especially in other Nolan films. I just think he uh, he's done better with this story and his uh, characters rather than like uh, really sell the audience on the, I guess, gimmick of the plot with like Inception or Tenet, where like in those movies, I feel like he just loses his characters. Like they don't really have anything to particularly grasp yeah. onto. Like Cobb just has like a family, and I he... appreciate that in Inception at least he tried to characterize them. Yeah, but at the tried. same time, it's just it's so inconsistent because I watched Inception again pretty recently, and just yeah. I'm watching it, and the entire time it's these characters are so fucking stupid. The entire mm-hmm. time they allow because like the entire crux of the conflict is the fact that they even allow Cobb to enter like and it incept the dream in the first place, which is a horrible fucking idea, and Cobb should know better. But, like, mm-hmm. I don't want to get into Inception, because that's a whole He loves fact. his wife. <laughs> his wife killed herself, and it somehow was able to frame it on him, despite the fact that she checked into a different hotel. And <laughs> oh, Yeah, God. that's a whole different can of worms. Yeah, it's there's sad. a whole... Yeah, that, 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 more like a can of scorpions. And then, like, <laughs> I know it's intentional, but, you know, Dunkirk didn't really have any you know character, yeah. like, characters you would like write home about yeah but no but, uh, that's the point it, i don't think yeah. it, it has to again i think dunkirk actually manages to separate itself by, by being a true story about a truly horrific war event because like if you yeah. like i get i i know that there's like in a movie there's a movie out there called atonement which actually does focus on a character and he's like part mm-hmm. of that whole event but that movie is more of like a character movie that's based on it. That's meant to be a character movie. But Dunkirk, I don't know. It's meant to be more about an event. So I don't yeah. feel unsatisfied when the characters aren't, you know, anything amazing. As long as they're like, can you, as long as I can attach myself to how they're feeling and how they want to get out of that, off that beach and out of that scenario. Like I, I relate to that already because it's like, yeah, I mean, if I were being fucking stupid every 20 minutes and shit, yeah, I'd want to get on a boat and get the fuck out of there. So 
you know, I, I really like how they yeah. just relied on every, the audience, the audience members understanding of a tense situation to make the characters, you know, to make me attached to the characters. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can also keep in mind Dunkirk is the shortest film Nolan has ever directed, which, which also, also makes it a little better because it doesn't feel like it's stay overstaying its welcome. It's right. actually rather it actually wraps up in a rather satisfying and quick way. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to talk too much about Dunkirk. I felt like I talked a lot about it, but, you know, I, <laughs> we're talking. Do we, this is basically. This is basically a Nolan discussion at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When you talk about other, when you talk about one Nolan film, you kind of have to dive into the other ones, you know, yeah. a little Christopher bit. Christopher Nolan is a brilliant director who desperately needs his brother to help him write a quality screenplay for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember Dan Harmon talked about it when he was talking about Interstellar, where he was just like, because oh, you're going to be watching something that's like really beautiful, and then three hours in, you're going to be like, what? why? Like. <laughs> <laughs> But you don't get it, Benny. Love it. is the one thing that drives us all. I I don't you <laughs> don't get it. It's gravity. You his don't daughter. get it. It's gravity. It's gravity. <laughs> he loves his daughter. You sick bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I it's kind of like the same thing with Kubrick or um, Hanukkah. Like I can't talk about one of his movies without discussing the other ones a little bit because there are so many yeah. things that they do that carry over to their other films. Granted, I, I respect and love Kubrick and Hanukkah like much yeah. more than Nolan at all, but, but you know, still. Oh, yeah. that's just well, yeah, because yeah, like, I think the closest we've gotten to like a Kubrick-esque Nolan movie is Dunkirk, because Dunkirk is very similar to 2001 in that it's more about like visuals and plot and the yeah. world. Yeah, rather, I forgot how fucking mind blowing the cinematography is in that movie yeah, when I rewatched yeah, it. Because like when you watch two thousand one, like it's not really about characters; it's more just about like the overall cinematic experience of it. The and characters the, and very, the thematic very, elements very and the themes, yeah, yeah, the themes and all that stuff as well. And I think and I, it I, still I, manages to be one of my top ten favorite movies of all time. So real, <laughs> real. <laughs> Kubrick is so good; he doesn't even have to write amazing characters, and boom, there you mm -hmm. go. <laughs> going back to nolan um yeah. it really interests me how he's gonna tackle oppenheimer especially yeah. with that insane cast that he has he's gonna oh like, that's a problem for me that that's a problem yeah crackers. it's it's an issue i had with dune it's hard for me to connect to a Famous movie and it's literally just all like a celebrity dump like i'm yeah. not saying that these actors are bad or they played the characters not well i mean especially oscar isaac and uh and what's her name? Rebecca Ferguson. Like they did, they yeah. did especially great jobs with their roles. But like, it was hard for me to fully, especially with Zendaya. Like, what the fuck? Why was she even in the movie? She was in the movie for like five minutes. She was just <laughs> a character. And then, and then Josh Brolin. Like he was fine too, but he was literally just Josh Brolin. Like the only other actor aside from the other two that I previously mentioned that were any way close to being a character was probably Javier Bardem. But that's mainly that's mainly because I could I didn't even fucking recognize him when I first saw the movie. I was like, who the fuck is this random dude in the middle of all these celebrities? And I look it up after and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, when I see like I, I love Killian Murphy. I think that he's at least gonna do an amazing job. He's always great in pretty much everything oh, he's yeah. in. Mm -hmm. but um but yeah when i look at the cast uh, like matt damon's in it apparently and i'm not a, I'm, oh yeah, I'm not oh, yeah. A fan i had the same issue when i watched matt damon. interstellar i had the exact same problem when i watched interstellar i was like i'm not oh, a, I'm not a matt like... damon guy if he weren't in the movie <laughs> contagion would be a seven if he weren't in the movie contagion would be a seven I'm, i don't think I... it's bad i just think it, it just depends on the role he typically just plays himself like, he's pl he's done like two or three characters that I can see like okay he's good in the role but he's still fucking Matt Damon like Matt Damon Matt Boston. Damon he uh, he he was okay in like the Bourne movie the first Bourne movie because he was clearly just a character he was just clearly just playing himself oh good one yeah, I don't know that's what I'm thinking yeah oh yeah I I haven't seen that movie I've only seen I've so I've only good. seen like. I've seen like five Gus Van Sant movies, but I haven't seen Goodwill Hunting. What the fuck's wrong with me? Oh, I haven't seen my private Idaho, his, and not I haven't as good seen as his remake Cowboy. of Psycho, though. His remake of Psycho is his best movie. Masterpiece. Though. So good. <laughs> Aaron, do not cut any of this out. We need to get the entire conversation. <laughs> Dude, we aren't even talking about the prestige. I know we're not even talking about the prestige anymore, but I don't care. We're just talking. Yeah. It, like, all right, I, I, I don't have a lot. I don't have anything else to say about the prestige. If I've talked about everything I want to talk about. Yeah, if we're um, ready to move on to the ratings and Nikki's recommendation, then let's do it. Oh yeah, um, I love this movie. Uh, 
current favorite film of all time. It took me a while to really appreciate it, I think, because I saw it when I was like 15 or whatever. And then I went back and I rewatched it last year and it really like I I just really loved it because over the course of like the past like couple over the past like seven years now, I've been like back when I was in 2015, I was like very obsessed with like presentational aspects. And not to say the movie is presented badly, but really the star of the movie is like how is the script and how it's written, because like. I think, and and like considering how many years has passed and I'm much more obsessed with screenwriting because that's like my, my major and that's what I'm going to work and that's what I'm trying to do for a living is I think I really appreciate this movie on a writing perspective. I think in terms of writing, I think it's kind of perfect in terms of like specifically plot character and theme, I think. But like, obviously there are some small issues that I take with it but they don't ruin the experience for me at all. So I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10. Nice. 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 Uh, I, I uh, went with the rating before, but now I think I'm just going to upgrade to a solid 7 instead of a light 7. I've, I've gotten more out of it after, after a rewatch. I'm, I'm now like actually interested in seeing it again. So, you know. That should probably tell you about how much I appreciate this movie. Really solid Nolan. Not my favorite, but still really solid. Yeah. Seven, seven out of ten. Nikki? Um, I'm going to go with a nine. Based. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. Yeah, this was a very satisfying movie to watch. It's not my personal favorite Nolan. I th- still think Memento takes that uh, crown film. for me. Yeah, so good. We should talk about that one, too, at some point. Yeah. And, yeah, I think I'm going with the seven. Strong seven. Uh, It's great. Anyways, let's get going with the... Let's go with the best part of the conversation, the next conversation. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, boy. All right. um, So it's my turn to choose the movie, and it's actually funny because um, in the beginning, Vinny actually brought up the movie that I want to wreck. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. God damn, I have a um, worse memory. <laughs> <laughs> and the movie that I want to wreck um, for us to discuss is the first Alien and second Aliens. So. Let's go! Nice. Yeah. Okay. I need to rewatch Aliens in forever. Awesome. I haven't seen it in so long. I've never nice. seen Aliens. That's awesome. I've seen Aliens. Uh, it's been years, mm-hmm. though. Uh, me and Nikki, we actually recently... Like back in like uh like I don't know fucking six months ago or something we watched the first yeah. Alien but I kind of watched it more passively I wasn't really paying attention mm-hmm. so you know I gotta I'm I'm now I have an excuse to actually pay attention so yeah <laughs> yeah awesome. all right so you heard that here folks yeah. watch the Alien and Aliens movies yep to join us in the next I will episode. be watching every single alien movie oh god oh, boy. <laughs> oh, alien, oh, boy. alien covenant for, oh, an alien resurrection we actually, like, should we make it like a bonus discussion and talk about like other alien movies like i don't know yeah, i feel like i want to rewatch, I wanna so, like, rewatch prometheus and covenant just so i can shit on those movies honestly like i i kind of want to do that Coming is really yeah, hard to get like, through. <laughs> well, if, if we if we make a conversation about Prometheus, it's gonna be fucking like so long because I have so many things. That, that movie is oh, so God. many problems. That movie is a complete disaster. <laughs> we can do it. We can do it. It'll we'll have fun with it. We're just here fuck to it, fuck around. Bring in Aliens yeah. vs Predator. <laughs> no, yeah, Aliens. Yeah. Yeah. I would rather. I would rather die. Paul Anderson. <laughs> Holy shit! The best Paul Anderson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The better one. Director better of one. fucking Mortal Kombat. Right? <laughs> and whatever that other movie was, Death Race? Death, yeah, Death Race. Race. Thank you for watching, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good day. Goodbye. Goodbye.